Martha Brotherton, 18-year-old convert from England in 1842, immigrated to Nauvoo, Illinois with her parents. Brigham wanted Martha. Joseph, I'll arrange it. In a room with Brigham and Joseph, Martha said no. More cajoling, more persuading, no. Please let me go. More cajoling, more persuading. Joseph went so far as to say, if you don't want Brigham, then you can divorce him and I'll take you. She said no. Finally, she convinced them to let her go because you know why they were afraid to. And so under the condition that she would deceive her parents and not tell them anything about the meeting, she was allowed to leave. She told her parents everything immediately. They talked to some people in Nauvoo. They packed. They left. She talked to a reporter for the St. Louis Bulletin, and her account was published July 15, 1842. Of course, Smith denied everything, and the damage control machine went into motion. He issued false affidavits, just as he, as was Sarah Pratt, and statements that labeled Martha a liar, apostate, and mean harlot with other salacious rumors that weren't true. Fake excommunication was used at times. When uh, William Clayton was afraid that the neighbors would talk about the new plural wife he had just taken, Joseph said, if they raise trouble about it and bring you before me, I will give you an awful scourging and probably cut you off from the church. Then I'll baptize you and set you ahead as good as ever. <laughs> That'll fake them out. <laughs> Orson Pratt admitted he deliberately misled his listeners regarding the practice of polygamy. But he did not consider it to be lying. It was done to protect a higher law than man's misguided laws. Joseph Smith considered the saints, the adults, to be little children in spiritual stature, perhaps in intelligence, because they're little children. They're unable to bear all things now. It's for their own good. Those of you who are in the counseling profession recognize this as classic abuse. Keep the secrets. It's something you talked about the other day as codependency. Don't tell the secrets. It's for your own good. I'm trying to protect you. Well, leaders after Smith lied. And in fact, uh, we'll talk about how it led to the creation of the fundamentalist polygamy movement going on today. After Mormon lobbyists assured congressional members in Washington, D.C. they no longer practice polygamy in Utah with the approval of the, from the first presidency, Apostle John Taylor admitted to church members in Nephi, Utah that the statements made in Washington were a damned lie. Probably to reassure them. <laughs> Expediency. Charles W. Penrose, apostle and counselor to two presidents of the church, admitted that after Joseph's death, Certain facts about him were purposely withheld from church publications for prudential reasons. Yet at the same time, you can read in the church history, everyday members were tried in high council courts for their honesty or lack of it as lack of Christian conduct and the such. Lying was so prevalent as an institutionalized scheme that they brought back the old William Cl Clayton ruse among church members, 1860s to 1880s. John D. Hicks revealed that when polygamists were prohibited from voting, the Mormons promptly swore that they were not polygamists. When those who taught or practiced polygamy were discriminated against, everybody immediately became silent on the subject. When members of organizations which advocated polygamy were denied the ballot, they withdrew from the Mormon church. Of course, their names were still kept on the records of the church as members, but they withdrew to become eligible to vote and support the church. A church authority would say that he no longer gave recommends for marrying plural wives, but he gave them for obtaining, quote, whatever blessings the Lord might bestow. <laughs> and you all know that a lot more code words than this were used, and they began in the Nauvoo uh, period. Code words assured the faithful that recommends for plural marriage were still being issued. Don't you worry your pretty little heads about that. <laughs> While misleading the American public, 
to make them believe that the practice had stopped. Evasive and code word and other rhetorical techniques are still very effective communication tools used by the church today, where an audience member who's one of the initiated understands the esoteric language being used perfectly, while the unknowing and uninitiated public receive an entirely different message of assurance that whatever they're denying is in fact something they are not practicing. Beating the devil at his own game. Thomas J. Rosser was a missionary in Wales in 1908. He asked his mission president, Charles W. Penrose, if the 1890 manifesto, supposed to ban plural marriage but did not, was a revelation from God, making known to a long answer, brethren, I, Charles W. Penrose, <laughs> I'm gonna, I just want to talk like that, <laughs> wrote the manifesto with the assistance Okay, with the assistance of Frank J. Cannon and John White. Then, continued Penrose, Wilford Woodruff signed it to beat the devil at his own game. John Henry Smith, apostle, remarked that the manifesto was only a trick to beat the devil at his own game. Joseph F. Smith said something in a meeting that Florence Ivins, daughter of Anthony W. Ivins, remarked about in one of her journals. She asked her mother why her father was so upset after a meeting of the apostles in the first presidency. President Smith said he would lie any day to save his brother. And uh, Florence, Florence's mother said it, it bothered her father. Matthias Cowley quoted a member of the first presidency who said, he had taught him that he, the member of the First Presidency, would lie like hell to, pro to protect the brethren. Fake political parties. During the 1890s, opponents charged that a theocracy existed in Utah, and church leaders controlled all the elections. Leaders instructed members to pretend to align with different political parties then. George Q. Cannon said that the political gains were made sincerity irrelevant in this case. Matthias F. Cowley stated in a hearing before the Quorum of the Twelve in 1911 that he had been chastised for asking permission to predate post-1890 plural marriages to make them appear to have occurred before the manifesto. He said he was trying to illustrate, quote, the training I have had from those over me and that training was to act with duplicity without asking for permission in order to preserve the image of plausible deniability for the church hierarchy. Again, a practice alive and well in 2008. Ironically, after claiming he'd been taught to lie by previous leaders, Kelly also claimed, I am not dishonest and not a liar and have always been true to the work and to the brethren. We have always been taught that when the brethren were in a tight place that it would not be amiss to lie to help them out. <laughs> Stop calling me a liar. <laughs> Constant lying by leaders of the church led to the belief that plural marriage would always continue secretly while being practiced. Well, being denied publicly, practiced uh, privately. Wink, wink. Dozens of prophecies declared that polygamy would never be repealed or the Lord would reject the Latter-day Saints as a church. Dozens of them. Um, D. Michael Quinn's Post-Manifesto Plural Marriages. One of the best articles you'll ever read on this. And then B. Carmen Hardy's Solemn Covenant. Really, in fact, Hardy has a, a, an, an appendix called Lying for the Lord in the back of his book. If you haven't read them, you, you will like them. Great, great resources and references. So taken together with, well, the leaders say one thing in public, but they really mean another with the deceptive code words and the prophecies in, by the prophets that we will never abandon polygamy or else we will be rejected by God as a church gave birth to the modern fundamentalist polygamy movement who continued to practice 
feeling absolutely justified that they were continuing the work of the Lord.